Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, as mentioned, my name is Juliette. I'm an associate professor of surgery at the University of Toronto and a surgical oncologist focusing on neuroendocrine tumor at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. And I work in the Susan Leslie Multidisciplinary Clinic for Neuroendocrine Tumors over there. I'll be talking today briefly about how to understand and manage carcinoid crisis from the perspective of somebody who's going through those treatments. So the carcinoid crisis and the carcinoid syndrome was initially defined uh, back in the 70s. So we've known about this for quite a while. And essentially, it is a syndrome that is related to an excess of serotonin. It mostly happens in people who have small intestine or long neuroendocrine tumors that produce an excess of serotonin. And that comes from the primary tumor. It can come also from uh, spread or metastases in a primary tumor. In general, the serotonin that comes from the tumor will reach the circulation and become clinically important only if there are liver metastases or if the tumor sites that are producing the hormones are not drained by the liver. The reason for that is that in general, if the blood with the excess of hormone goes through the liver, the liver will inactivate those hormones because it filters things out. So for anything to be clinically meaningful or lead to symptoms, there has to be number one, an excess of serotonin production. And number two, there has to be either a bypass or impairment of the liver to filter that serotonin. Now, how does that manifest? I'm sure a lot of you know this way better than I do. Carcinoid syndrome with the excess of serotonin will lead to diarrhea. And we talk about profuse diarrhea that cannot be stopped by anything, can happen any time of the day or night flushing. And I found that often patients will tell me that their loved ones will notice the flushing more so than they do because they're used to looking at them more often than we look at ourselves. And then finally, wheezing, which comes from a constriction of the bronchi in our uh, respiratory system. How is that diagnosed? In general, is from those symptoms, but sometimes it's more challenging. It's a bit more subtle. So people can have what we call subclinical carcinoid syndrome meaning that they have an excess of hormones and the hormones are elevated. We can measure that, but they don't have all the symptoms. So it's there, it's just not manifesting in a way that can be measured by symptoms yet. So how do we assess carcinoid syndrome? What well, has to be an excess of serotonin? Serotonin is not something that can be measured in and of itself. So we have to measure its byproduct called 5-HIAA. That's what the serotonin is broken down into, and that's what we can measure in either the blood or in urine. In general, this is done with a 24-hour urine collection, and I'm sure those of you who went through it know how pleasant and how convenient this is. It's our gold standard. It's what most centers still do nowadays, but the good news is that there is other techniques that are coming. And so we now have some assays that can measure serotonin in the blood. Uh, we're still learning how this relates to the measures we used to have with urinary serotonin. Not all labs are able to do it yet, but it's something I think that might become standard of care as we get more used to it. Now, I talked about the main three symptoms of carcinoid syndrome. Those are the ones that everybody is used to hearing about, but there's a lot of other ones as well. There is other repercussions of excess serotonin. First off, there can be fibrosis, and that's particularly relevant for people with small intestine neuroendocrine tumors. So just as serotonin being released around the main tumor, so around the small intestine, around the lymph nodes, close to the small intestine, can create some scarring in that area. And what that does is that it creates sort of a spider web around the blood vessels that feed the small intestine and can lead to a lot of symptoms such as cramping in the abdomen or blockages in the intestine. Excess serotonin that goes to the heart can also create heart disease by damaging the heart valves. So if there's too much serotonin touching the heart valves, it can create again fibrosis or scarring of the heart valves and dysfunction in the heart. So that can be a very significant repercussion. And then finally, something that is a little bit more subtle is cognitive dysfunction. It's not something that is very well described or very well known, but we know it exists, is that um, excess serotonin can lead to kind of slowness in the way people process things. So it may not be something that would be diagnosed as a cognitive dysfunction on standardized tests, 
but people can be slowed down enough that it affects their daily lives and their performance and their productivity in life. And that can have a huge impact on quality of life. Now, how do we assess carcinoid syndrome and what do we need to look for? So the first thing is that we need to know whether your tumor is producing serotonin. So we need to know what we call the functional status, and that means measuring this 5-HIA, the breakdown of serotonin, and knowing if it's high or not. If it's normal, then there is no carcinoid syndrome. If it's high, there can be either a subclinical carcinoid syndrome in case there are no symptoms, or there can be a clinical carcinoid syndrome in case there are symptoms. Second, we need to look at the repercussions of the carcinoid syndrome on your health and on your function. So the first step is an echo, so it's an ultrasound of the heart uh, to assess whether there's any heart disease. And in case of abnormality, you should have a cardiology assessment. And then we also want to assess nutrition and support. So we see um, in particular for diet or for cognitive dysfunction that you're supported as well as possible, depending on the specific repercussions of the syndrome. Now, something that we talk a lot about is what happens when people are subjected to stress. Stress can take a lot of different forms, right? It can be general anesthetic if you're undergoing surgery. It can be direct manipulation of tumors that are secreting hormones. So think about you have a tumor that is secreting hormones. If you push on that tumor, if you poke it, then it's going to be triggered to secrete even more hormones. And then stress itself, such as general anesthetic, can also produce more hormones. So what happens, you can have what we call a carcinoid crisis, whereby there's a sudden release of serotonin that can lead to changes in your health, in particular in your blood pressure or your heart rate. The important thing to know is we believe this crisis is triggered mostly by serotonin, but there's probably also a lot of other factors that play into this crisis. So there's probably other hormones, other factors that are triggered by a carcinoid crisis that are very important how the crisis develops and how it pans out. And we don't know everything about this right now. The one thing we know about it's serotonin, but we also know that it's not the only thing that is involved here. Now, what does this look like? This is a video from Dr. Janice Pasika, who is a surgeon in Calgary in Canada. And it's one patient who had a carcinoid crisis during surgery. So what happened you saw initially is just the monitoring from the anesthesiologist and the blood pressure dropped significantly and then the patient turned all red or all flushed. And so this is a typical carcinoid crisis. Now, it's a pretty um, striking example. Not all carcinoid crises are that clear cut, but in general, what a carcinoid crisis is, is an abrupt hemodynamic change or instability. So changes in blood pressure or heart rate with manifestations of the carcinoid syndrome, such as flushing, for example. And that can lead to what we call a cardiovascular collapse, meaning that the heart and the blood pressure drop completely and is not supporting your body anymore. What are the criteria? In general, we say that if the blood pressure drops below 80 or rises above 180, if the heart rate rises above 120, which is quite fast, and if this means that the blood is not able to circulate to all your organs to provide good perfusion or good vascularization to make those organs work, then there is impairment and that means there is a carcinoid crisis. When we look at this in a lot of details with very careful measurement, it's about 30% of surgeries or carcinoid crisis can happen. Now it takes all sorts of different forms, it can be very severe and prolonged or it can be in most instances, thankfully, uh, less severe and quite short-lived. And so what we've known from different studies on this is that we suspect that the serotonin plays a role, but like I mentioned, it's not the only thing. There's a lot of other mediators that play a role in carcinoid crisis, and we don't know about all of them, first. And second, we don't know about how to control all of them. And I think that's important to understand when we talk about how to manage this. So what to do about carcinoid crisis? Um, this is a movie that I watched a lot as a kid, and that's what um, I thought about when I was putting this together, is that there is what we used to do then, and that's there's what we're doing now, that we have a better understanding of what's happening. So then, which is what I suspect probably many of you have heard about, is you need to have prophylaxis or preventative treatment for carcinoid crisis. And that would be injections of octreotide, so the short-acting one, for days prior to an intervention. 
And then during the intervention, the anesthesiologist or the doctors are told to give you a perfusion of intravenous octreotide medication that blocks the serotonin and that only if the crisis persists for more than 10 minutes, then there's a typical assessment and additional treatments are done. And in general, people are told to not use what we call pressors or medications that make your blood pressures go up for fear of triggering a crisis. But now that we better understand what's going on, I think that a more contemporary management of this is some people have suggested that we do not need to use preoperative octreotide. Because when we look at what happens in patients treated in contemporary years, if they receive the octreotide or not, the incidence or the occurrence of the crisis is the same. It doesn't truly prevent it. And that makes sense, right? Because it's not only related to serotonin. Octreotide only blocks serotonin, doesn't block the other things. So it's not that effective. And during the surgery, more and more people are recommending to not use the octreotide intravenous. And what we need to focus on is identifying if a crisis happens so that as soon as it is identified, the entire team knows about it and can put in place the appropriate treatment. And the priority is not so much prevention because we don't know that we can prevent it, but rather early identification and upon identification, a very rapid correction. And that can be done with medication that target your blood pressure that traditionally were thought to not be possible for neuroendocrine tumors. And now we know that not only they are safe, but are actually needed. And so what this means is nowadays, you don't really need to have a preparation prior to a procedure. Is it going to hurt? No. Is it going to help? No. So all it can do is be quite annoying uh, to go through and it doesn't really make a difference. Um, so it's not necessarily anymore. And during the surgery, you don't necessarily need to have that octreotide infusion that everybody is used to thinking about. The most important thing is to have a good expertise within your team. So you want to have any procedure done in a center that treats a lot of patients that have carcinoid syndrome that could potentially have carcinoid crisis so that if it happens, the team knows immediately how to identify it and how to rapidly correct it. Now, does octreotide hurt? Is it wrong if somebody tells you to take octreotide and wants to give it to you? Um, no, it doesn't really hurt. The issue is if you rely on it exclusively, it can be a problem. So the problem with the octreotide is if people think that because you've had octreotide, because they're giving you octreotide, it's the best thing ever and things are going to be good, it may delay the initiation of the treatments that you really need are really effective. So that's why we tend to say now to not rely on the octreotide and not use it necessarily up front. So what do you really need? I think that for both major and minor procedure, there needs to be a consideration of the carcinoid syndrome and the carcinoid crisis. So first, it's important to know whether you have carcinoid syndrome. That's the basics, right? Then if you have carcinoid syndrome, make sure that that is worked up correctly so that you have a 5-HIA or a serotonin level documented, that you have an assessment of your heart. Now, depending on that, you can get other assessments like cardiology, for example. Before you have a procedure, you should get an anesthesiology consultation and the anesthesiologist should be aware that you have carcinoid syndrome and be comfortable identifying and treating it with contemporary treatments. Octreotide is not necessary, so you can manage without it. Continue your current treatment. So if you're already treated with lenreotide or LAR, for example, just carry on with it if you're already on it. And then finally, there's maybe a few of you that take medications called SSRI, uh, their medication for anxiety or depression or other mental health disorders. And traditionally, there was a thought that you needed to stop those before surgery, but there's a few studies now that have dispelled that and you should continue on them. It's probably better for your health to carry on with them. And so with all of this, what should you tell your healthcare providers? Because not everybody may be used to treating patients with carcinoid syndrome. So I think it's important to tell them whether you have carcinoid syndrome or not. What are your symptoms and what are their control with your current treatment? If it is associated with heart disease, and then what medications you're on currently. And tell them that what you need prior to a procedure is to be assessed, so there is a plan in place, to be monitored during and after the procedure. I think it's important to have access to specialized cares, like major procedures in people with neuroendocrine tumors and carcinoid syndrome should only be done in centers that have the expertise to identify and manage it quickly. Finally, I wanted to say a word about those alerts, because I hear lots of people tell me that they have those bracelets or the watch or a card about 
having carcinoid syndrome and that they need to show this to their healthcare providers. I would suggest that there's some caveats with this. It's a good thing to have. It's a good thing to let your healthcare providers know you have carcinoid syndrome, but it's also important to understand that other things can happen to you as well. And as somebody with neuroendocrine tumors, depending on what your tumor is like exactly, in general, you can live very long, healthy, and fulfilling lives. So a lot of other things can happen to you that are not related to neuroendocrine tumor. And I've seen so many patients go to the emergency department or to their primary care provider. And as soon as they're labeled with a neuroendocrine tumor or carcinoid syndrome, there's those blinders that come on. Whereas like everything that happens must be related to that. And we lose perspective and we miss other things. I've had a patient who went to the emergency department with atypical symptoms and was told that it must be related to his neuroendocrine tumor. When he came back to my office to get that assessed, he was having a heart attack. And that heart attack was mistaken for issues with carcinoid syndrome because as soon as people saw the diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumor, that's all they could think about. So it's important to think about other things that can happen and not only focus on the neuroendocrine. So in summary, when talking about carcinoid crisis, I think it's important to know about it, know if you are at risk. So ask your oncologist if that's something that you should worry about and if it matters for you. And then important to know that the management is changing. We do not need to rely on octreotide preparation. So if you do not receive an octreotide preparation, it is okay. It's probably good. The most important thing is to get assessed for risk and for the procedure you're having and uh, to get those procedures and incentives that have expertise in treating patients with carcinoid syndrome. And then finally, I think it's extremely important to remember that other things can and for sure will happen to you. And it's not all related to carcinoid syndrome and we need to get those blinders off sometime and think about the other things that you can get proper treatments for those. And with this, I will leave you on this picture. One of my partners took of the CN Tower in Toronto on neuroendocrine tumors day that was donning their black and white stripes in honor of neuroendocrine tumors. Thank you very much.